Well, good morning, everyone. It's really great to see you. Uh, welcome to Follow. If you're online and you're watching from home, welcome as well. It's really good that you can join us. Can I, can I make a, a suggestion? And it's, you're all going to look at me and go, nah, I know. But can I just suggest that you move forward a little bit? Because it gives more room for the thousands that are going to come in after, just a little bit late, you know? So uh, what's the laughing about here? <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. Don't be shy, don't be shy. <laughs> it's wonderful to be here, it's wonderful to be here to praise Jesus, to lift up his name. So I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to sing a song that we've used a lot online, it's called Battle Belongs to the Lord, but it's a great song, a great song of truth. Um, so let's enjoy, let's lift up our voices. We're here to praise God. You know, we're not just here to, uh, to be entertained, but we're here to really lift up our voices and give God all the glory. So let's, let's sing this morning. There's nothing 
nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I'll fight, I'll fight on my knees, with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you, and everything I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible. can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go Please take your seats. You've got all the praise. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Follow Baptist Church this morning. It's great to see you all, and it's great to be here worshiping God today. And so whether you're here in the room or you're watching online, we just want to give you a warm welcome. Uh, you're all part of our family. It's just wonderful to have you here uh, gathering together at Christmas time. So for those that haven't met me, my name is Luke Williams. I'm the lead pastor here at Follow. So if we haven't met, Please come and say hello after the service. And I've got with me today... Uh, Josiah. I'm our youth ministry intern, so I help run our youth ministry and do bits and bobs. And Josiah's done a wonderful job this year with you, so why don't I give him a round of applause? It's all the job. team. It's all the team. Yeah, all the team. That is a team effort for sure, but it's really great to be worshipping Jesus at Christmas time, isn't it? Just to remember who he is and all he's done for us. It's just a wonderful thing to be able to do. And um, for the first time, anyone's able, able to come today, which is wonderful. So uh, that's exciting as well. Well, we're going to do our one-minute welcome in a moment. And if you're visiting today, um, or if you haven't been here before for a one-minute welcome, um, we never want any person here at Follow to feel alone. 
We never want anyone to be by themselves and no one talks to them. Um, at a church, we want everyone to feel welcome. And I had an email a few weeks ago from a, a young girl that used to come to follow a number of years ago. Uh, she's now moved into state. And she sent me a message on Messenger just saying, Luke, I just wanted to let you know that I'm so thankful for you and the team at Follow for how welcoming you are. And she said, we've moved into state. We've tried a number of churches now, and we haven't had a single person speak to us in that time. And she said, we're okay. We're mature Christians. We'll sort of become part of the answer in those churches. But she said, I worry about people that, that don't know Jesus. Maybe they're going to church and it's their last resort and no one talks to them. And we never want to be that church. We want to be a church when people walk in here, they experience the embrace and love of Christ. And so that's why we do a one-minute welcome. And let's be honest, sometimes it can be awkward, can't it? Getting up and talking to someone you don't know or someone you haven't seen for a while and can be a little bit awkward. But as a church, we always want to be that kind of church that steps out in faith and does the awkward things just to make sure that no one feels unwelcome or unloved at our church. And so how do we do that? Um, well, if you are online watching over there through the camera. Um, so I want you to get out your phone, text someone, call someone, because, um, hey, we're never actually spot on a minute. You, you all know this. It's like five minutes at this point. Um, if you're here, we want you to do the, uh, the what's it called? The, the pig's roast or the, the pig on a spit? Is that what we used to call it? You're telling the story, mate. I'm okay, not sure. pig on the spit. Yeah. We're basically, you know how you, you know, slowly rotate it. You get, get it cooked properly. So I want you to stand up. We're going to go slowly around. You've got to shake hands, say hello, um, wave oh. at the person across.
56, 57, 58, 59, and 60. Well, that's one minute. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is a follow minute. How good was that? I hope you didn't have your phones out because uh, either the phone's lying or we are. So, and we couldn't be lying that that was a minute, right? So yeah. The, yeah. the problem with me service hosting is that I can't stop talking when I go and talk to someone. So one minute just keeps stretching out. So Josiah came and rescued me. So, um, But it's good to be social, isn't it? It's good to catch up. Three people think it's good to catch up. Excellent. Excellent. It's so good to see people and to be in a room with people again. So, uh, But well done. It's been a big journey the last couple of years. And so just to be back with one another, uh, it's just a wonderful thing. So great to catch up. Well, um, we've got a few announcements as we do that. Um, our giving details will come up on the screen. And just want to say a huge thanks to everyone who generously gives week after week to the work of Jesus here at Follow. Uh, it's been wonderful to, um, yeah, just to have people giving so generously. And we've been able to bless the community this year. Uh, we had the food van starting up again the other night. We've given out heaps of hampers and toys to kids this Christmas time. And then all the normal expenses are covered by people's generous giving. So just want to say we don't take that for granted and we really appreciate it. So if you're a regular at Follow and you don't regularly give, that's how you can do it online. If you're one of those people who loves to bring your tithes and offerings with you every week, you can still do that. We don't pass a bucket around anymore because COVID. Um, but there's a bucket up at the hub. So if you'd like to do physical giving, you can go and put it up there. Penny's holding it up for us now. Do it again, Penny. There you go. Yay. Looks like the Ark of the Covenant, that thing, doesn't it? <laughs> It's great. So you can put your money in the Ark of the Covenant back there after the service. Um, youth had their break up the other night. We did. And Josiah's our youth leader, and I heard it was an amazing night. So Josiah, yes. tell us about it. Um, so yeah, so last night was our Christmas breakup party. It was the finale um, for the term and, and for the year. It was our, yeah, our only chance that we were able to meet, really, um, in term four. And... God absolutely blew our minds. We had the highest attendance we have ever had at a Follow Youth event in five years. Right. So what, God just blew our minds. He, he showed that in a time that has been so difficult with online, obviously, as we've all seen, numbers have been dropping. Everyone's sick of Zoom. Um, and so our attendance was dropping on that. We weren't too worried, though. But then God just like, hey, no, I'm working in this. I'm working in this season. Um, and we had probably five to ten new people um, and it was one heck of a night. It was amazing. Yeah, great. And some great sixes coming up as well. Yes, yes. Year That's seven next good. year. So for those parents that have got year sixes moving into grade seven. Yeah, it's happening. Yeah, they're yeah. growing up. I know that's a fear <laughs> of a lot of the parents. Yeah. yeah. I often say there was kids before COVID that were like this big and now they walk in like, good day, mate. And they've got a beard. You know, it's like, <laughs> what happened? Um, but yeah, it's pretty amazing. Like, your brother is here today. Look at this. Jacob, stand up. Yes, I'm putting you on the spot. He is now tall. Before, well, taller. Before COVID, he was in nappies. And look at him now. He's, like, <laughs> he's come out of it and he's... Uh, you can sit down, mate. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Brother's embarrassing you in front of everyone. Oh, but, but it's amazing. It's, it's great nothing. to get the young people back together again and just socialising with each other, which is good. Um, so what are you looking forward to next year with youth? Um, just continuing God's work. I think um, through this season, we've been reminded that this is God's ministry. It's not our ministry. It's not about entertaining youth. It's not about babysitting them. But it's about encouraging them and connecting them with one another, but ultimately, hopefully leading to a connection with Christ and seeing them come to know Him. So we're just excited to see where God takes us. Yeah. Absolutely. It's great. So speaking of Christ, it is Christmas. It is. And Christ is in the yes. word Christmas for a reason, right? Yes. Christ Mass. Mass means like a festival or carnival celebration. So That's what it is. For those who didn't know. We're celebrating Christ. Mm. So it's great. So tell us about the <laughs> Christmas Eve service and the dates for this year. Yes. So up there. Big old text, so that works. Um, so you can read that. But our Christmas Eve service will happen again this year. Well, on Christmas Eve, hence the name Christmas Eve service. Sorry, I'm reading notes. Um, so that's going to be taking place on Friday at 6 p.m. So that is Friday. Wow, that went so much better than I thought. Okay, excellent. So Friday, 6 p.m., we'll be here. We'll be running for a, an hour, maybe just over, and we'll have a few special touches on the night that will help us celebrate Jesus and, um, yeah, Jesus' birth. So also, um, for our Boxing Day service, that will be online only. So please don't rock up here, otherwise you will be standing out probably in the cold for, well, a few hours. So remember, that is on our online platform, so you can go to www.online.follow.church or go to YouTube and search up Follow Baptist Church from 10.20 a.m. 
Speaking of our Boxing Day service that is online only, um, as you've probably heard in the last few weeks that Luke has embarrassed me with, um, I'm preaching. So um, that is my first time preaching, so just please be praying for me. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's, I, yeah, yeah. Awesome. It'll be great. Yeah, I did a practice run through with me this week, and it's going to be a great message, so I think you'll really enjoy it. So make sure you're watching online that day. Don't come here unless you bring your phone, because you'll watch it online on your phone in the car park. Um, just stay home and watch it online there. It would be a much better idea. Over here, you'll see an extension of the platform. Do you know what that's for? You'll find out on Christmas Eve. So if you come back Christmas Eve, you'll find out why that's extended. But some special stuff on, New- on Christmas Eve, and it's going to be a-, a wonderful night. Did I say New Year's Eve a minute ago? Or did- I did. It's not New Year's Eve. Don't come in New Year's Eve. <laughs> Christmas Eve. I'm jumping ahead, but yeah. It's just a crazy so season, guys. That'll you be really good. <laughs> Excellent. The other thing you're probably aware of is we're looking for a new Follow Kids leader here at Follow. Uh, Esther has finished up. She's taking a job at a school next year, which is exciting for her and it's boo for us because she's done a great job and we we'll certainly miss her. Obviously, she'll still be involved in the program in some way, but we need someone who's going to be the coordinator for it moving forward. Um, and so if you're interested or you know someone who is, please let us know. We're certainly praying hard about that. Kids are so important and we really want our kids to continue to be discipled and blessed here at Follow. So let's be praying together. The more people that pray, prayer is powerful, right? So the more people that pray, you know, the better it is. And so let's be praying for Follow Kids Coordinator this week as you're doing your daily prayer. Vision Month is coming up. It is, yes. Well, it's in February, well, <laughs> January 31st, February, but Christmas goes like that, right? Yes. We're going to be blinking. We'll be through Christmas and New Year and um, Vision Month will be happening. And next year, the theme for our vision here at church is the theme of Together. And it's a beautiful theme to have after being so far apart uh, for so long. To be people that are back together is going to be really great. So as part of Vision Month, we're going to be having an art exhibition called the Together Exhibition. And I say we're having an art exhibition by faith, because if you don't do any art, there'll be no art exhibition. And so we're saying by faith there's going to be a great art exhibition. And we'd invite you to get involved. And so check out the screen and you'll get a few more details on that now. But follow, we are super excited, super excited about, Vision about Vision Month 2022. 2022. It's been a tough couple of years in our world, no doubt about that. But we're really confident that together, um, God is going to do some great things in and through us next year and beyond. And so accordingly, our theme for next year is the theme of Together. And to commemorate that, we're going to be running an art exhibition at the start of next year. And you might be saying, well, that sounds great. How do I get involved? Great question. Uh, You can get involved by clicking the link in our newsletter or on our socials and you'll be able to put in a submission to create some artwork around the theme of Together. And then in Vision Month next year, in our services, starting from January 30th through to the 27th of Feb, we're going to display that artwork on easels as people arrive and we're going to put on our socials as well. And so you can do any sort of art you like. You could paint, you can sketch. You could take photos, you could knit a quilt, you could write a poem. This is your chance to get creative and just click that submission button. And we can't wait to see some of the submissions that come in. And it's just going to be a great way to start the year and to get us focused around the gospel of Jesus Christ, believing that he's going to do some great things in and through us. And so it doesn't matter what age you are, I'd love to get the kids involved. It might be a great summer project for for each individual to do. And uh, we just can't wait to see the creativity that God's going to unleash through this project. Get ready, get excited, click the link, and we look forward to seeing those submissions.
fantastic. Can I invite you to stand? We're going to worship again. Let's worship God this morning.
us And if our God is with us Then what can stand against And if our God is for us Then who could ever stop us And if our God is with us Then what can stand against What can stand against What can stand against What can stand against Father, we just thank you so much for the words of that song, that our God is greater, our God is stronger. And if you are for us, who could ever stand against us? Lord, we declare that this Christmas time, as we remember the story of your birth, that in weakness, in what seemed to the world as a, uh, a very humble kind of beginning, Lord, through your fragility, coming as a baby born in a manger, Lord, we have the opportunity of eternity opened up to us. And Lord, you are just, uh, your wisdom is beyond the wisdom of this world. And Lord, we put our faith in you and re we remember that that same baby in the manger is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the name above every other name. And that's who we worship this year. Lord, we worship you and you are worthy of our worship. Worship is whatever we give worth to. And Lord, we say that we give our worth to you, that you are worthy of our praise, our gratitude, our thankfulness. And so this Christmas, Lord, I pray that we wouldn't get distracted with the tinsel and the presents and the busyness and the even the family stuff, which is all wonderful. But we would keep you at the center of everything we do and who we are. That we remember at Christmas the Christ, our Savior, our Lord. And so thank you for this opportunity to worship today. And we just commit this service to you in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Awesome. You can grab your seats. I'm going to invite Sarah up this morning. And Sarah this morning is going to be continuing our teaching series as we look at the theme of arrival this year at Christmas time. And speaking of arrivals, Sarah is one of those unique people that's turned up at Follow in the last year and a half or so mm -hmm. and has been part of our life group all year and so we know her really well. But many of you have probably never met her because we haven't been here. And so while I feel like she's kind of part of the furniture now, yep. some of you are probably thinking, well, it's a new piece of furniture that I haven't seen before. And I don't know, do you want to be called a piece of furniture? Probably not ideal, sure. is it? Anyway, <laughs> just an analogy. But Sarah, uh, it's been great getting to know her. And throughout lockdown, she's been one of the speakers at Sindel Baptist on their online services. And uh, she's a very gifted communicator. And so I thought it'd be good to introduce Sarah to the congregation today, um, whether you're watching online or whether you're here in the room, and just get her to tell us a little bit about herself. And so why don't we start with your family? Okay. Tell us a bit about your family. Uh, I'm married to Tim, and we have four boys. You sometimes hear them in the service. I have Josh, who's nine, Liam is seven, Caleb is five, and Michael will be three next month. Mm. Every two years, pretty much there for a yeah. while. Yeah, it'll keep you very busy with young kids running around. Yep. And um, I first heard of Sarah because my daughter used to go to Youth Dimension, and Sarah was one of the lecturers there. Mm -hmm. And so I lecture my daughters, they don't listen. But Sarah lectured them, and it seemed to get through. So obviously she's got a gift there. And um, so you were there for quite a few years. Yeah. Um, I started working there in 2005, okay. and I resigned last year. Excellent. So what so are you doing now that you've resigned from there, other than... Raising four kids and a family and, and all that stuff. doing lockdown schooling. And, um, yes. <laughs> I am doing my master's at Ridley College, doing a Master of Divinity. Okay. How, how long does that go for? Forever. Forever. <laughs> <laughs> Forever. It's meant to be three years, but with kids I'm doing it very part-time, so yeah. it's going to be forever. Okay. Well, it'll be wonderful to learn new yep. things. And, uh, yeah, so you've got to do what you can do at this with kids that age. I always yep. often talk about when our kids were young, it wasn't 
really thriving. It was surviving through that season. And uh, a lot of people nodding their heads this morning saying, yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, but it's wonderful that you're able to do that and to study as well and mm -hmm. to really go deeper in your faith and yeah, to great. learn more about God and, and obviously to use the gifts that God's given you. So we're really excited about you being able to do that this morning. And um, I've heard Sarah speak a number of times and she's phenomenal. So it's great to be able to have her no pressure, um, speaking to all of you this morning, so looking forward. She's going to be sharing from Ezekiel. Mm -hmm. um, what we're doing this Christmas is we're looking at some of the passages in the Old Testament that actually prophesied the, the arrival of Jesus and what that means for us. And so today, um, yeah, you've chosen a really tough passage. Uh, it's a vision that Ezekiel had, so there's all sorts of weird language and visions and all sorts of stuff going on in there. Um, but bear with us because underneath all the symbols and the vision there, there's some real beauty that I'm sure Sarah will bring out in her message today. Yeah. So just tell us one last thing. What are you looking forward to this Christmas time? Hopefully seeing family. Yeah. <laughs> we've had, just this week, two of my kids got exposed at school, so we've been testing and isolating and <laughs> we're all clear. Five what? out of six of us have been tested and Speak we are up, all clear. Sorry, <laughs> so hopefully... That continues and we actually get to see family. Yeah, yeah, very good. I'm sure that'll be the case. and It'll be wonderful this year to be able to do that with, with family around. Too much food and celebration and, yep. and just catching up with each other. So that'll be really good. Wonderful. So Sarah's going to share in a moment, but I've got to do the Bible reading first. I just realised I've left my Bible down here. So I'll grab that. So if you've got your Bibles, you can turn to Ezekiel chapter 10. And I'm going to read verses 1 to 5 and 9 to 22, and then Sarah will unpack that for us. So Ezekiel 10, uh, verses 1 to 5 first. I looked and saw the likeness of a throne of lapis lazuli above the vault that was over the heads of the cherubim. I told you it was a vision. There's some weird words in here. Um, there's some beauty in this as well. The Lord said to the man clothed in linen, go in among the wheels beneath the cherubim. Fill your hands with burning coals from among the cherubim and scatter them over the city. And as I watched, he went in. Now the cherubim were standing on the south side of the temple when the man went in, and a cloud filled the inner court. Then the glory of the Lord rose from above the cherubim and moved to the threshold of the temple. The cloud filled the temple and the court was full of the radiance of the glory of the Lord. The sound of the wings of the cherubim could be heard as far away as the outer court, like the voice of God Almighty when he speaks. Picking up in verse 9. I looked and I saw beside the cherubim four wheels, one beside each of the cherubim. The wheels sparkled like topaz. As for their appearance, the four of them looked alike. Each was like a wheel intersecting a wheel. As they moved, they would go in one of the four directions the cherubim faced. The wheels did not turn about as the cherubim went. The cherubim went in whatever direction the head faced without turning as they went. Their entire bodies, including their backs, their hands and their wings, were completely full of eyes, as were their four wheels. I heard the wheels being called the whirling wheels. Each of the cherubim had four faces. One face was that of a cherub, the second the face of a human being, the third the face of a lion and the fourth the face of an eagle. Then the cherubim rose upward. These were the living creatures I had seen by the Kabar River. When the cherubim moved, the wheels beside them moved, and when the cherubim spread their wings to rise from the ground, the wheels did not leave their side. When the cherubim stood still, they also stood still. And when the cherubim rose, they rose with them, because the spirit of the living creatures was in them. Then the glory of the Lord departed from over the threshold of the temple and stopped above the cherubim. While I watched the cherubim spread their wings and rose from the ground, and as they went, the wheels went with them. They stopped at the entrance of the east gate of the Lord's house, and the glory of the God of Israel was above them. Then these, uh, these were the living creatures I had seen beneath the God of Israel by the Kabar River, and I realized that they were cherubim. Each had four faces and four wings, and under their wings was what looked like human hands. Their faces had the same appearance as those I had seen by the Kabar River, each one went straight ahead. Good luck with that passage this morning, Sarah. We're looking forward to what you're going to unpack for us this morning from God's Word. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Um, well, before we start, let's pray. Lord God, we invite you into this space and we ask that you would speak to each one of us. Lord, we ask that you would... 
just speak to each one of us in a way that, that is meaningful to us. Help us to, to focus, help us to listen, help us to be open, particularly to whatever you want to speak to us. Lord, we give you this space and this time. May you have your way among us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What are you scared of? My kids could tell you I am scared of spiders. Now it is true that one of, it is true, one of my uh, requirements of a future husband was that he had to be able to deal with spiders. And Tim is very good with spiders. Um, but you know what scares me more? This is probably more unusual. I hate the thought of being stuck at sea. I just, I cannot handle the thought of it. I don't like that you can't see what's below the surface. I don't like, um, I really hate seaweed. Uh, I remember, I, was, I think I was a teenager, and we were down at Apollo Bay, and this one day there was just masses of seaweed, but the waves were really good. I wasn't missing out on the waves, so I went in in my wetsuit with gloves and with socks. And I must have looked ridiculous, but I did not want to go through that seaweed. I hate it. I really hate it. Um, there is no way I am ever going on a cruise. I've seen the Titanic. I know how it ends. <laughs> so you know what? It's pretty incredible that I went snorkeling on the Great Barrier Reef. But I did, and it was amazing. And there was this one incredible moment where I spotted a lone sea turtle uh, swimming gracefully through what was kind of like a, a canyon of walls of coral and fish going through and caught up in the moment and completely forgetting my fear, I followed this turtle and I swam and followed it for ages. And it was magnificent. And then eventually I surfaced and I had like a mini panic attack because I realised that I was alone and the boat and all the other snorkelers were miles away. And in the panic, just these, all these questions, are there sharks out here? Because, you know, we'd seen some that was apparently like, okay, sharks, but like, are there bad sharks out here? Does anyone even know I'm here? What if they live without me? You know, I was fine. But every now and then, I hear stories about people who have been left on the reef like Ian Cole, whose dive boat abandoned him in 2011, or Tom and Eileen Lonergan, who disappeared at sea after their boat abandoned them in 1998. And I wonder what that moment was like when they rose to the surface and realised they were all alone. Like the panic, the shock, the despair, eventually just the helpless resignation. And I wonder, have you ever felt abandoned? That same sense of despair, of helpless resignation. Have you ever felt like you're dr drowning alone in life? You know, I think it's a pretty fair bet that at least someone here feels like that. Or maybe you know someone who's drowning alone in their own ocean of abandonment. And what do you say to that person? What do you do? Well, this may surprise you, but the passage we're going to look at today gives us some answers about that. And it shows us how Christmas gives an answer. So we've been looking at Old Testament prophecies about the arrival of Jesus. And this morning we're looking at what everyone has been thinking, how the hang does this tie into Christmas? <laughs> Open your Bible to Ezekiel 10. So Ezekiel was a prophet in the 6th century BC. Um, he was living with other Israelites in Babylon, or modern-day Iraq. Now this is a place where the Israelites didn't belong. They belonged in Judah or Israel. They did not belong way out in Babylon. So what happened? How did they get there? Well, if you're familiar with Old Testament history, you who made covenants with the weaker nations, God made a covenant with Abraham's family, the nation of Israel. They would be his people and he would be their God. 
They will be loyal and faithful to him, loyal and obedient. And God would protect them, provide for them, and be present with them. And you know what? God kept his end of the bargain. But the Israelites, over and over and over again, they failed. And it's not just that they didn't do the good that they were meant to do. They did all of the evil that should never be done, including sacrificing their kids in worship of other gods. Until eventually God said, enough! Maybe you've said the same thing to your kids or your parents. <laughs> enough! And God said it to them, enough. Having already divided politically into two nations, uh, two kingdoms, God first sends Assyria against the northern kingdom of Israel and wipes them out. And when that fails to deter the southern kingdom of Judah from her sin and idolatry, God sent the Babylonians against them, who capture groups of Israelites and deport them back to Babylon. Which brings us back to Ezekiel living in Babylon, having been exiled in one of the first deportations. Now, by all accounts, the Israelites in Babylon have to have been abandoned by God. Because Jerusalem was where God was present. The temple, God's dwelling place, was where God lived. And the people weren't there. They were way out in Babylon. So God must have abandoned them. These are a people who know what it feels like to be abandoned by God. Now, Ezekiel's not just your average Israelite. He's a prophet. And in chapters 8 to 11, this whole chunk of the book, Ezekiel experiences a vision from God. And in this vision, he is taken from Babylon, where he physically is, to Jerusalem. And while in Jerusalem in this vision... Throughout chapter 8, Ezekiel is shown around the temple where he witnesses the obscene idolatry being committed by the Israelites there. And then in chapters 9 and 11, he watches the judgment that is proclaimed for Jerusalem and its leaders. But the devastating climax of this vision comes in chapter 10, our passage. As the narrative momentum slows to focus on the glory of the Lord, which Ezekiel pauses to describe in vivid detail. Now, I'm not going to reread it all. We've heard it. I'm going to draw from it as we go. So keep your Bible open so you can keep it up where we're at. So Ezekiel sees the glory of the Lord on a brilliant blue throne, verse 1, made of lapis lazuli. Some translations use sapphire. And under the throne are four cherubim. And beside the cherubim are these strange wheels. That's verse 9. I was going to have an image for you, but you know, artist impressions just aren't that good. So I want you to kind of think about it. Oh yeah, I'm meant to be doing the slides. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> so nothing, nothing is really relatable in this, but I want you to imagine it. There is a blue throne. On the throne is the glory of the Lord. Underneath the throne are cherubim. We'll talk about them in a second. And next to the cherubim are wheels. It doesn't make sense to us, though, does it? But to those listening to Ezekiel share this vision, two things about this vision are totally obvious. One is that it's about God's presence. Can I go backwards? It's about God's presence, and his presence is mobile. I'll say it again. This vision is about two things. It's about God's presence and his presence is mobile. Firstly, the inclusion of the cherubim screams that this is about God's presence. So we think of cherubim as things like this. The winged, cute winged little babies. Who came up with that? <laughs> cute winged little babies, sometimes with arrows, shooting at people to make them fall in love on Valentine's Day. That is not the image of cherubim that Ezekiel gives us. Um, cherubim in both scripture and other ancient Near East cultures were imposing hybrid beings. This one up there is a neo-Assyrian cherubim. Um, they were imposing hybrid beings. Ezekiel's had four faces, that of a cherub, a human, an eagle, and a lion. 
and cherubim were always, always tied to the presence of deities. In the ancient world, statues of hybrid beings guarded the temples, and they were the throne bearers for the deities. Exactly like we see on the Ark of the Covenant, the cherubim there, and exactly like we see here in Ezekiel's vision. Throughout scripture, cherubim denote the presence of God. There is no ambiguity here. This vision is about the presence of God. Now, along with the cherubim, there are wheels. Now, this is where the vision gets a bit confusing. I'm going to read from verse 9 and 10. I looked, and I saw beside the cherubim four wheels, one beside each of the cherubim. The wheels sparkled like topaz. As for their appearance, the four of them looked alike. Each was like a wheel intersecting a wheel. They're like a wheel intersecting a wheel. What on earth does that mean? We don't know. No one knows. All the commentators have different theories about maybe it's like a gyroscope or... We don't know. What we do know is that the sparkling wheels can freely move in any of the four directions that the cherubim face. The cherubim and the wheels, and therefore the throne above them, move together. What we have is a picture of a throne chariot for God. The Lord's throne is mobile. So the temple is the Lord's house, it's his dwelling. But the throne chariot in this vision makes it clear God's presence is not confined to the temple. Which brings us to verse 18. Then the glory of the Lord departed from over the threshold of the temple and stopped above the cherubim. While I watched, the cherubim spread their wings and rose from the ground. And as they went, the wheels went with them. They stopped at the entrance of the east gate of the Lord's house and the glory of the God of Israel was above them. The cherubim and the wheels transport the divine glory or God's presence seated on the throne out of the temple. Now the idolatry that I told you about in chapter 8 was scandalous. And the judgment in chapters 9 and 11 is shocking. But this, the departure of God's presence from the temple, is next level. It's like exposing an affair or requesting a divorce. It's like Owen saying that Promite is better than Vegemite. It's not. <laughs> but why? Why is this next level shocking? Because the relationship between God and people was always defined by his presence. It was always defined by his presence. You know, God was present with Adam and Eve in the garden temple of Eden. He was present in the cloud and the pillar of fire with the Israelites as they wandered through the wilderness after being freed from slavery in Egypt. His glory, his presence filled the tabernacle and the temple, the places where the people worshipped him and where he dwelled. But now he will be present with them no more. He abandons his house and seemingly his people because they abandoned their covenant with him. You know, God does exactly what he warned the Israelites he would do. Back when the temple was first dedicated by Solomon, God warned the people. After filling it with his presence, he gave them this warning, 1 Kings 9, 6 to 7. But if you or your descendants turn away from me and do not observe the commands and decrees I've given you and go off to serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land I've given them and will reject the temple I have consecrated for my name. And so God leaves. And the people are left drifting out at sea. And you know, there is this sense of grief in the telling of it. When we moved to Pakenham three years ago, 
It was a reluctant move on my part. We were living with my parents in Oakley, and it was a pretty good gig, I admit that. But you know, we had three boys, the fourth was on the way, and we needed our own space. They probably needed theirs too. Um, and Pakenham was where we could afford. But you know what? I loved where we lived. I loved the house. I loved the parks. We lived next door to a park. I loved the proximity to shops. Pakenham sucks for shops. <laughs> I loved the my son's school. I loved being close to family and friends. I didn't want to leave. And so when the time came, I sent Tim with all the boys and I drove myself. And by the time I got, by the time I got out of my street, I was a sobbing mess. By the time I made it to the freeway, which was about two minutes down the road, I was howling with grief. Anyone driving past me must have wondered what on earth was going on. And really, it's a wonder I didn't crash. There was just so much anguish in the leaving. And you know, we get the same sense here with God as he leaves the temple. There is grief as the Lord leaves his house and his people. He doesn't just up and go in a rush. It takes us two chapters to get through it. In 10.4, he moves to the threshold of the temple. In 10.18, he moves from the threshold to his throne above the, the cherubim. In 10.19, he moves to the entrance to the east gate of the temple. And finally, in chapter 11, verse 23, he leaves the temple and the city altogether. There's a sense that God is pausing, hesitating, as though he doesn't want to leave. Do you feel the hesitancy? But in judgment of the people, God abandons his house and seemingly his people and opens the way for the destruction of Jerusalem. Can you imagine the sense of shock and disbelief among the exiles as Ezekiel shares this vision? No, you are wrong. God said he's going to live in the temple forever. It's his house. But then six years later, Babylon conquered Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and confirmed the vision. God indeed abandoned his house, his land, and his people because they broke their covenant with him. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Feeling ready to celebrate? No? That's pretty awful, isn't it? You're all thinking, she was going to give us good news. But before we move on, let's pause for a moment and take in the warning that Ezekiel issues to us even now. Sin and idolatry is dangerous. Take seriously the threat of anything that will compromise your devotion and your worship of God. Examine your priorities and your motivations. They'll reveal who or what has your heart. You know, as the new temple of the Holy Spirit, we are called to purify ourselves out of reverence for God. 2 Corinthians 7.1 So back to the Israelites in Babylon. Ezekiel's vision of God's abandonment must have left many of them thinking, is this it? But there were two reasons for hope. Firstly, one year before this vision of God's abandonment, Ezekiel, in chapter 1, had another vision, his first vision of the divine glory. But this time the divine glory was on its throne chariot riding through Babylon. Though they may have felt abandoned and though all the evidence said that God had abandoned the exiles, God was with them still. As Ezekiel 11.16 confirms, God is present with the exiles as a sanctuary for them, even as he abandons his sanctuary in Jerusalem. But secondly, in Ezekiel 40-48, to Ezekiel has a vision of a new temple, a new city, the renewal of the people and their worship of God. And part of that vision is Ezekiel 43.1-5. to 
Then the man brought me to the gate facing east, and I saw the glory of the God of Israel coming from the east. Verse 4, the glory of the Lord entered the temple through the gate facing east. Then the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. This vision is a promise of hope. It's the promise that the divine glory will return. In Ezekiel's vision here, the divine glory follows the exact same route back that the divine glory took when it left. It reverses exactly the departure. And unlike this almost hesitant departure, the divine glory returns and arrives in a rush, like someone running through the airport when they've landed, desperate to reunite with their loved ones at the arrival gate. This was a promise the exiles clung to. God would not abandon Israel forever. Do you need a promise like that? God would return and dwell with them again. As a nation, they would again be his people. And when the exile ended and they returned to Jerusalem, they rebuilt the temple with great anticipation. Is this the moment where God is going to again dwell with us? But God doesn't fill that temple with his presence. And as the period of the Old Testament comes to a close, as the temple remains empty of his presence, as the years and decades and centuries pass, hope and fear linger. You know that mix when you're hoping for God to move, when you're praying for an end to the status quo, when you're desperate to know his presence, but you're fearful that maybe he won't meet you in that place. You're almost scared to pray in case your prayers remain unanswered. They knew the hope and the fear. When will Yahweh's glory return? Will we ever know his presence again? Has God really abandoned us forever? Hope and fear fill the years until one night in Bethlehem. A baby's cry breaks the silence. An exhausted but delighted mother wraps her baby and places him in a manger. And a new dad stares in awe. And over on a nearby hillside, the sky fills with angels who proclaim the news to a bunch of terrified shepherds. As John writes in John 1, 14, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the long-awaited moment. The divine glory has returned again to dwell with humanity. It's not simply that the glory of Jesus, a man, has been seen as though Jesus is somehow less than God. Jesus is the divine glory, as the writer of Hebrews affirms. Hebrews 1.3, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. You know what, Matthew affirms it too in his gospel in ways that clearly evoke Ezekiel's visions. And one of the clearest allusions is in Matthew 12, when Jesus makes his triumphal entry into uh, into Jerusalem and enters the temple through the east gate. He takes the exact same route that the divine glory took when he comes back in Ezekiel's vision. And it exactly reverses the journey that the divine glory took when he left the temple. Matthew loudly proclaims the divine glory has returned. The divine glory is Jesus. You know, most astounding is that when the divine glory finally returns, it isn't simply as a presence filling the temple. No, incredibly, the divine glory returns as one of us. When John writes that the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, it literally means the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Just as God was present with his people in the tabernacle, God is present with his people in Jesus. God incarnate. This is why Jesus is called Emmanuel, 
God with us. This is the glorious good news that Ezekiel prophesies. And this is the glorious good news that is fulfilled in the arrival of Jesus. God is with us. Better than the shadow that is only with you in the light, closer than any person can possibly be with you. God is with you. Now he's with you as you celebrate with your Christmas turkey. He's with you as you gather with your friends and family around the Christmas tree. He's with you as you celebrate all that is good. And isn't it going to be good to celebrate Christmas this week? But you know, he's also with you as you mourn that empty place at the Christmas table. He's with you as you struggle with the temptation that begs just once more. And he's with you as you face the shame that sits as uncomfortably as sand in your bathers. You know what I mean. God is with you. Let me say it again. God is with you. Suck on it, digest it, take a deep breath of your soul and inhale it. God is with you. It doesn't always feel like it though, does it? When all you can see is a vast ocean of hopelessness, when waves of shame come crashing over, or when the uncertainty or enormity of a situation makes it so hard to breathe, it doesn't feel like God is near. And when you feel like you're drowning in an ocean of abandonment, it's really hard to have hope, isn't it? But that's not the message of Christmas. As we approach Christmas in our sin, in the hardship of life, in a world where there is so much darkness and uncertainty, we are reminded that Christmas is a message of hope. It's the hope that flows from the knowledge that God kept his word. He came back as promised and he will do so again. It's the hope that was born in the knowledge that God came, became one of us so that he could be fully with us, that he could empathise with the human experience because he himself has lived the human experience. He knows what it is to be stressed, to be tempted, to grieve. This hope was birthed with the birth of a baby, but it's hope that must have been really hard to believe as Herod went on his murderous rampage to try and find and kill the baby. Hope that was hard to hold on to for the 30 years whilst that baby grew into a man. Hope that was impossible to cling to when that man, Jesus, was crucified and buried. But it was hope that was proved true when Jesus, God with us, rose from the, to life on the third day. When he vanquished darkness and evil. When Jesus proved that love wins, that God has not forsaken us, that God will not abandon us, and he will rescue us if we ask him. And you know, if while we were still sinners, God did this for us, then we can know with certainty God is with us. Having died for us, he will not now abandon us. You know, just as we could not earn his forgiveness and love, we cannot now earn his presence with us. God is with us, not by our works, but by his grace. In 1997, a two-year-old boy was kidnapped from out the front of his home in China and trafficked away. Can you imagine, as a parent, his dad spent the next 24 years scouring China on his motorbike, searching for his son. 24 years! But in July this year, he found his son. Imagine that reunion. After all that he did to find and rescue him, do you think that man will now abandon his son? There's no way. 
My daddy even wanted to let him out of his sight. He traversed China to find his son. God traversed heaven and earth to become one of us to rescue us. Will he now abandon us? Now, one of the most beautiful details in Ezekiel's vision of the divine glory returning is described in Ezekiel 44.2. After the divine glory fills the temple, the east gate to the temple is permanently shut. The implication is clear. Having returned, the Lord will not again leave and abandon his people. He's staying. We need have no fear that God will abandon us. You can know with certainty that no matter how hard life is, and I know for some of you life is really hard at the moment, no matter the circumstances, God is with you. Christmas is a call to faith and to hope in God. And you know, if you're listening here this morning or online and you don't know the Lord, then this is an invitation for you to put your trust in him. God is present with his people, with those who admit their sin and their need of a saviour with those who place their trust in Jesus and choose to submit to his lordship. If you don't know Jesus but want to, or if you've got questions about him that you'd like to explore, don't let this moment pass. Talk to someone about it. You know, whatever you are facing this Christmas, heed the words of Jesus. I am with you always. Matthew 28, 20. Now, Christmas is not about presents. You listening, boys? Christmas is not about presents. It is about presence. Gee, that's hard to hear the difference, isn't it? Christmas is not about presents. It is about God's presence with you. Let the unwrapping of presents this week remind you that you are wrapped in the presence of God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We just thank you. We thank you that you didn't abandon humanity. You haven't abandoned us. As promised, you came. And one day you will come again. And in this moment... Regardless of circumstances, we have hope because you are with us. We can trust you. We can trust your love for us. Your presence in the midst of whatever life brings makes a difference. Remind us of that this Christmas. Lord, I ask for us, each one of us, that as we do unwrap presents this week, that you would remind us that we are wrapped in your presence. Lord, in all of our celebrations this week, may you be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Sarah. That's amazing. Let's stand together. in these words. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him. Christ
Wonderful carol that is, oh come let us adore him. That's what Christmas is all about, right? To adore Jesus. And I just want to say that was a wonderful message this morning by Sarah. So I really appreciate that. Just some incredible truth. And we've been on a heck of a journey in the last couple of years around uh, women in ministry. But for me, it's all worth it to see people, both men and women, being able to use their gifts to glorify God, whatever the gifts they are. And it's just wonderful this morning to be able to hear the, the Word of God unpacked in such a difficult passage, in such a beautiful way, in such a relevant way for us this Christmas. What stood out for you, mate? Every, everything? Uh, <laughs> no pressure. Um, but. I was genuinely tearing up. So it just reminded me so much of so many of those truths. I think in a crazy time such as COVID, it's so so easy to feel abandoned, like we're, we're, we're you know, coming up out of the water and we can't see anything. But God is there. God is with us. So thank you so much for that reminder. It's such a great truth. Yeah, I think God is with us. It's just so powerful that Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, that he now dwells in us. It's no longer I, but Christ who lives in me. And so his presence is with us everywhere we go through every circumstance of life. And so I just want to encourage you in that. Uh, this Christmas, if it's a wonderful time, if it's a difficult time, if it's somewhere in between, God is with you in all of it. And so you can turn to Him and trust Him. So thank you so much, Sarah, for sharing that this morning. It was absolutely beautiful. Well, this morning, love you to stay around and join us for morning tea. Um, the kitchen will be open, so there's tea and coffee and biscuits in there. The coffee machine's open for a gold coin donation. Woo -woo. All proceeds go to local outreach, and so go and grab an awesome coffee, Bermuda coffee. Bermuda coffee. Lachlan so runs good. a company called Bermuda <laughs> Coffee. Good beans over there. So make sure you go a coffee after the service. Continue the conversations that you started at the start of the service. Make sure that we're a welcoming church, not just in the one-minute welcome, five-minute welcome, six-minute welcome. <laughs> the whole day, uh, the whole week to come as well. And so please stay around and enjoy morning tea. And don't forget our Christmas Eve service. That is happening Friday at... Awesome. Nice. Good work, everybody. Um, yeah, for those going away over Christmas and January, we hope and pray that it is a refreshing time. We hope uh, you stay safe out there. Um, and we look forward to a great 2022. Now, just quickly remember that next Sunday is online only. That is online only. So head to our online platform, www.online.follow.church, or go to YouTube, Follow Baptist Church.
Mm. But before next Sunday is Friday, right? Yes. So Friday, then Sunday. Christmas Eve. Make mm. sure you're here Christmas Eve. Yes. Invite your friends. It'll be a great presentation of the gospel as we finish our arrival series. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone. And have a great week as well. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.